Welcome to Harvest to Pour, the business of beverages, with your host, Matthew Schiff. This is the podcast for all of those who are involved in the agriculture all the way to the distribution of beverages. And now your host, Matthew Schiff. Hello and welcome to Harvest to Pour. I'm your host, Matthew Schiff, and today I am here with Derek Martin, the owner of Martin Brothers Winery. They just recently moved out to Colorado from Herman, Missouri. So how are you doing today? Oh, pretty good. How about yourself, Matt? Great, great. So uh, let us know a little bit about yourself, how Martin Brothers Winery came to be. I know it's got, it's got a great history and kind of where you are with the company right now. Yeah, so I'm Derek Martin. I'm the owner of Martin Brothers Winery. It kind of started back in 2009. I was actually graduating high school at that time, and I have the youngest of four total Martin brothers and my two oldest brothers and my parents kind of kick-started the idea of opening a winery. We were located in Herman, Missouri. It's one of the AVAs in Missouri. Great wine country there. A lot of Norton grapes. We originally started planting a small Norton vineyard, you know, 350 grape vines, just enough to do a small batch. As time progressed, you know, we filed for our licensing and everything with the feds and the state. We opened to the public in 2014, and at that time, we primarily had some mead or honey wine, and we had only used the Norton grapes once, and we quickly discovered that, you know, people who visited the dozen wineries around us, they tried a ton of Chardonnays, a ton of Norton wines, they were intrigued by mead, you know, what is this thing, it's honey wine, you know, is it sweet, is it dry, what's it supposed to be, so they're really intrigued by that, so... You know, a couple of years after that, we ended up removing our vines and focusing entirely on honey. So now we focus on what's called a traditional mead. We highlight specific honey varietals. So whatever bees pollinate, for example, like orange groves, beekeepers will bring the beehives to the orange groves, pollinate orange trees, and that's how we're able to get an orange blossom honey. So that's an entire focus now. So the Martin Brothers Winery name is kind of synonymous with a meadery now. It's kind of funny. We just never changed our name because it kind of had some ground there already as a winery. So we're just kept it as it is. It's interesting. I had a lot of people ask me, it's like, well, honey wine, is that the same thing as mead or is mead the beer or is the honey, which one's which? So, yeah. so you call it honey wine just because you are a winery. Is that pretty much the, the gist of it, but it is mead? Yeah, that's suggested it. There are some technicalities, of course. So technically, if you call it a honey wine, you're allowed to have in a certain amount of grape juice, for example. So that's why on our labels, we'll put, you know, 100% wildflower honey mead. We want to be transparent on what you're actually consuming. There's no grape juice or fruits in any of our products. It's literally a traditional wine fermentation, but entirely honey. So traditional wow. winemaking principles, right. really. So, but night and day from what we start with. So what of getting to the point where you, so you started, so you've been involved in this since 2014 or 2009? But 2016 is when I was involved full time. That's when I graduated college. Okay. I have a degree in mechanical engineering, actually. Um, Throughout my college curriculum, I did, you know, interns and co-ops and I really wasn't liking the corporate engineering world. And I was really intrigued by self-employment, always really have been. It probably stemmed from my father, who was also an entrepreneur of sorts. So 2016, I graduated. I had a couple offers, but I just dove in head first at the winery and helped it grow from 30 gallon batches to 150, then 500 gallon batches and now our batch size is 1100 gallon batches which uses about two tons of honey per fermentation so when you joined up in 16 you, you 2016 you were definitely getting in on the scaling of the of your product yes what was some of the challenges you kind of came into get, getting you know, getting to that scale that you your goal was back in 2016 yeah so i mean big factor of course is cost of honey i mean it's it's significantly more expensive than like the cost per ton of grapes. But, you know, when you buy bulk grape juice or by the tonnage, it's ready to ferment, you know. But when we buy honey, it's by the ton. You got to source it from here and there and everywhere, especially since we use honey varietals, you know. Um, so early on, a lot of it was cost. And it's funny, not just cost of dollar value, but cost of time as well. Because to ferment 30 gallons or 150 gallons, it's almost the same time to create that alcohol and get it ready for bottles. So. Oh, wow. So you, could, so you had the, the cost of money and time. So what were your, what were some of your processes you developed to kind of bring that down and make that, you know, more economical? So for us, it was focusing on which strain of yeast we use because each strain of yeast for the alcohol fermentation is completely different. And to create an efficient fermentation isn't always necessarily time-based. It's also the quality of the fermentation. So early on, especially like our dry meads, we did play around with strains of yeast to kind of help develop flavor. But 
over time, it was tailoring those fermentations of each honey varietal to what strain of yeast we were using. Okay. And how does that, how does it tying the, the strain of yeast to the honey you're using, does it reduce the time of fermentation? Um, some of it, yeah, reduced the time of fermentation. Some of it actually took longer too. So it kind of depended. We really just striving for quality early on. So um, okay. it was difficult to grow at each stage because it's super costly, of course, and we didn't want to eat up too much time. But in the end, our goal was quality. And that's why, you know, we ended up removing our vineyard and going all in on honey. Mm -hmm. Not many people have done it. We're technically Missouri's first meadery. If you look it up, Martin Brothers Mead is also a registered trade name back in 2009. So I guess that was always the intent. We just never fully realized it. <laughs> Interesting. Like how you know, each product's going to take you. That's, that's really cool. So get a little bit in the heart of the, of the show here, the harvest to pour journey. So you're def your harvest is obviously sourcing honey from different locations. That obviously has an effect on flavor, type, and taste of your your bead and then you also have kind of what we we're just talking about there how you're making it uniquely yours uniquely i mean there's other meteries out there but yours is i'm sure different because of the way you source and then when we get into the pour the pour is kind of the how you market how you get people out there how you get people to well pour your product and want more and so let's go back to the the harvest so how did you get into or you know get that knowledge towards harvesting different honeys how do you get enough of one source type to make enough mead and so on yeah it's a good question and that's another you know challenge as we scale that i didn't mention is the honey itself because as much as we would love to use local honey there's just not that many local honey producers that can produce enough to do you know an 1100 gallon fermentation that's two tons of honey so mm. deal primarily with they're called commercial beekeepers. They primarily make their bread and butter by being paid for pollination services. Um, the prime example is almond trees in California. Over the winter time, a lot of large beekeepers bring their beehives there. However, almond trees aren't really a nectar producing tree, so we don't get honey from that. That's just kind of their business side of things. But mm -hmm. those same beekeepers, they may be based out of the Midwest, like Iowa, for example, but they'll travel to Florida and Southern California to pollinate orange groves and when they do those pollinations, they can get an orange blossom honey and they'll extract those, put those in 50 gallon drums and they'll ship them to us. So it's kind of interesting, you know, the journey of moving from Missouri to Colorado. People are always like, oh, where do you get your grapes? You know, because they don't really realize that we deal with honey. It's like, well, we deal with honey. Yeah. So we've always been sourcing it from all over. You know, we get a blueberry honey from Canada, for example. Our orange blossom wow. comes from Florida, Southern California, and coastal Mexico. We do an alfalfa out of central Wyoming. So we've kind of been in the sourcing game of honey for a little while. And each time we work with those beekeepers, they learn something new too. So one interesting thing on in the technical side of things is we all only will use honey less than a year old because depending on how they store the honey, it could absorb a lot of things from like those drums that it's stored. For example, we've historically found like toxic levels of iron for a fermentation and we would have to clean up that honey before we even use it because we only buy raw honey we don't buy wow. honey so there's a lot of okay. intricate things that you don't really think about until you get to that scale i'm assuming the one year is trial and error on your side you yeah with this yeah early on i mean we would just use oh if this honey's good we'll use it and we didn't care about the harvest date for example and we're, like we would have varying fermentations even with consistent starting honey you know parameters and consistent fermentations some of them would struggle, some of them would stall out. And, you know, there's a lot of reasons for that. There's a lot of things in honey that you don't really think. I mean, bees, they fly all over there. Well, my brother would call them as dust collectors, you know? <laughs> so whatever is in that yeah, area, yeah. that's also going to be in your honey. So you kind of had to become honey chemist in the, in the, in the, in the process. Okay. Yeah, kind of. So what are the other challenges you've kind of run into, or you maybe even currently working with, with that harvesting and the sourcing of the honey at the moment? Um, at the moment we're, so we relocated kind of on the western slope of the Rockies. So we're a little more rural than we even were in Missouri. Herman, Missouri is always mm -hmm. seen as a rural Missouri town, but we're, yeah, we're pretty far out here now. So, um, logistics, it's definitely, you know, mail takes two to three days longer sometimes. And if there's snowfall, we just got a foot of snow overnight. So that affects freight logistics and whatnot. But yeah. with uh, honey, it's kind of its own sourcing game. We don't always tie that you know, just in time manufacturing is close to starting the fermentations. We're kind of 
always looking for what honey's out there, what's going to be coming soon. Because like I said, since we want fresh honey, you know, we might be working with the beekeeper that hasn't harvested that yet. So it's, it kind of worked out, you know, logistically, it's not the end of the world that we're a little more rural because we're continually sourcing. So. And I know with wineries, usually the, the months of like, I guess, August through October are real big because they're harvesting and converting that and starting the conversion of, of the grape to wine. Do you guys have a particular season? Are the bees like, I mean, are you, since you're sourcing from all over, do you have multiple production times or do you have one big production loop? One big production loop that's continuous. If we wanted like ultra fresh honey, like oh, less than a month from harvest, then it kind of would play into those seasonalities mm -hmm. of those crops, you know, like blueberry season, okay. we'd have to harvest our honey around then and start that fermentation then. But, you know, sometimes we'll have, honey that was harvested a few months ago. Sometimes we'll have har honey that's going to be harvested two months from now, for example. So it's a year round production cycle and it, it's kind of it's fortunately constant. easier in that regard. So a lot of okay. So you are constantly producing and when it comes in. All right. Yeah. Just kind of curious. Okay. Does that affect the numbers you can put out? With respect to what? Uh, the, the, uh, the mead. Does that, does that affect the, the, the numbers that you can like, instead of doing it all at one time, getting all of your your bottles out at a certain point in the season, do you feel that you can do more, produce more because you're producing throughout the season or less? Oh, yeah. Yeah. That's a very good pun. I didn't really think of that because we always just gone into a continuous production cycle. That's a good point because winery, they have a certain capacity based off of how much they harvested, how much is available and they, they can't sit on grape mm -hmm. juice. So fortunately we can sit on honey for a little bit. So that's a very good point. You know, we can literally maximize our capacity year round because we have the ability to store that honey. Yeah. All right. Great. I'm glad <laughs> I could help. <laughs> so going in, kind of moving into the production, now you have all this honey, you can, you can store it, you can, you can make it. Do you, do you blend the honey or do you typically, how do you make this honey mead uniquely yours beyond the sourcing? Yeah. So we make it uniquely ours through consistent quality fermentations. Primarily we haven't done any honey blending yet. We currently have a goal of highlighting honey varietals because it's not even commonly known, you know, the amount of people that you meet when you get talking about honey varieties, they don't comprehend it. And you're like, oh no, there's like orange blossom honey. They're like, oh, so they put oranges in with that honey. It's like, no, no, no. It's from bees pollinating orange trees, you know? <laughs> so it's uh, really yeah. interesting. So because of that, we've stuck with, you know, honey varietals at the moment. So one on my wish list is like a raspberry blossom honey. So kind of pricey, not terribly available, but it's one of those that I'm going to need to jump on when it is available. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Well, have you, I guess we can start, I guess, from that processing, moving into the pour, the marketing, making some of these that are, might be more pricey, but in probably in fewer amounts, have you, have you played with that as like, this is a one, you know, one off seasonal, only 200 bottles and, and how, how's that affect your, your buyers, your, your clients? Yeah, we've definitely done that. Um, kind of unintentionally we haven't done small runs to where we'll have like a 200 bottle run and we hype it up and raise the price a lot of people do that and it works well for that for us it's just keeping up with demand you know we get toward the bottom of a pallet and haven't started the next fermentation for that product line and you know that mm -hmm. comes with the public knowledge and then people hoard it all up you know and <laughs> kind of buy it last. Oh, so okay. yeah it's kind of right now we're just trying to keep up with demand we haven't done any small runs too small to run because there are a lot of more specific honey varieties like meadow foam that's really big in the meat industry right now and even large honey producers they may only have a drum per year and that's not enough for a oh, wow. fermentation yeah so there are some more varieties of honey that the meat industry may be familiar with that we we don't really touch we kind of we're a little bit above that scale and we kind of need to stick with honey that is a little more available i guess okay so one of your open challenges right now, is it safe to say, would be meeting your demand already that you're having? Yeah. I mean, we're, we're at three product okay. lines at the moment, what we typically have six. So we're sold out of half of our products. And Blueberry Blossom, that was a huge hit. And we've been sold out of that for a couple of years now. And a lot of that coincides with the challenges of moving from Missouri to Colorado. So. All right. Yeah. I was wondering about that. It's like, I, you're just getting logistics of everything from Missouri to Colorado and getting production up and spinning again. Besides, what is your, do you have any, 
I guess as an open challenge, what do you what are you thinking are solutions to answering that demand for more more products? So once we get our production up, we have a more efficient setup here. Once it's set up, okay. it'll be a lot easier to keep up with demand. Um, in Missouri, we had a lot of challenges with our cooling system. So all our fermentations we do in stainless steel tanks with or without mm-hmm. oak. So a lot of temperature demand on an 1100 gallon fermentation and continuous mixing. So we had a lot of, we could only use about half of our production capacity at a time because of that. So here we have a lot more efficient setups. So once production's up and running, we'll be able to do two simultaneous fermentations and get our products back out there faster. Oh, okay. so you've, you've already devised a solution. You just get to test it now. Yeah, exactly. So, and it's, it's still a pretty limited production area. I mean, we only have three fermentation tanks, but we'll utilize two of those at the time. And that's, that's 2,200 gallons fermenting. So, and we're still a small company after all. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's, that's, that is a big demand. I mean, and you're going, I'm assuming you're going into some grocery, not just to, to private clients. Yeah, correct. So we do online okay. direct to consumer, but we do have distribution throughout Missouri now through smart distributors. So they'll be distributing us statewide. Um, we've gotten products in the St. Louis, Columbia area, starting to get into Kansas City and Springfield area now. So definitely keep your eyes peeled. Oh yeah, definitely. I am. I'm looking forward to trying this out. The more we talk about it, the more I'm like I want some of this. Awesome. Yeah. So this is good. All right, and and Derek was actually kind enough to send me from uh, Colorado two of his bottles of of Mead Honey Wine. So he sent me the first one. Here is the. Uh, the wildflower honey wine. I think you mentioned it earlier in the podcast. It's more of a dry wine. One of your favorites? Yeah, that's currently my favorite. It's actually the last right. bottling that we did in Missouri before we made the move as well. So pretty happy ah. with this one. We use a blend of wildflower honeys from all throughout North Central and South America. South America, we get some organic wildflower through from Brazil, actually. So oh, wow. It's pretty cool to... The wildflower honey in general, seasonality of it, there's always different things in blossom. So, and we get it from different places. So... There's slight, slight nuances from batch to batch, but this one I'm pretty happy with. We cool. fermented it in stainless with oak. So it's 65% American oak, 35% French oak. I think I want to do a little more American next time. I'm a little more biased towards American oak characteristics, but pretty happy. Yeah, with yeah. Nonetheless. And then we did yeah. oak did slightly as well with that same oak when the fermentation was completed. So light oak, but okay, pretty good one. So it's just, it's just, it just aged for how long in the oak? Just stayed. So, not including the fermentation, yeah. So we're aging it in the stainless with oak staves and cubes, primarily for okay. consistency as well as oxidation control in the stainless tanks. Mm-hmm. So excluding the fermentation, once that was complete, it's about six weeks. So pretty light oak aging, but you still get some of those subtle nuances as well. As little more notes. Okay. So since we don't add any fruit to our meads, fermenting it can complete dryness, you do lose a little complexity of those characteristics of the honey. So it was really interesting to add some of those oak notes in there as well. And this one recently cool. won an award last year as well at the National Honey Board Mead Crafters Competition. Honey Board Mead Crafters Competition. Where was that located? So that's held in St. Louis, actually. So wow. the National Honey Board every year, they host a, what they call it, the Mead Crafters Competition, and they highlight select meads from all over the U.S. That's neat. That's neat. From all over the U.S. So this is held in Missouri. That's, is there any reason it's held in Missouri? Is this like a, an origin? I think a lot of the... National Honey Board team is based out of St. Louis, coincidentally. So they kind of held it here. And it's also kind of a center point as well. So, because there are judges that do fly in from like New York and all over. So, oh, really cool. And I believe the other one you brought me is this is your kind of the house favorite or the close client favorite, your orange blossom meat. Yeah, the orange blossom. So, this one is a semi sweet. So, entirely orange blossom honey here. We get Mm -hmm. specific batch, at least, is a blend from Southern California and Florida. And also some honey from coastal Mexico. So again, even though it's a traditional or a varietal honey, it's entirely from bees pollinating orange groves. But even then from year to year, season to season, a batch of honey might have some more orange zest characteristics, whereas it also could have some more floral characteristics. So we noticed Hmm. the honey that we got from Mexico had some more like orange zest notes and some of the honey we got from Florida had some more of the floral notes. So we wanted to have both of those characteristics in there. So that's why we blended those, those three areas, California, Florida, and coastal Mexico. That's interesting that the, the pollen itself does still carry on the flavor of the orange a bit, or the zest at least. Yeah, it is. So that's really interesting. Yeah. 
And then sometimes too, um, they'll pollinate more than once in a season as well. So throughout that growing cycle of the orange tree itself, you know, depending on the nectar that those flowers produce, that's going to affect how the honey tastes in the air. That's interesting. That's really cool. So just seasonality towards pollinating and what comes out, what comes out. That's just brings up a ton of different questions that have nothing to do with the mead, but yeah, you know, it, float through my head. Yeah, this is really cool. It's very interesting once you get into the whole, you know, agriculture of the, just the bee pollination itself. I mean, mm-hmm. and that's kind of where we start. So it's our main ingredient, the honey itself. So there's a lot involved with that itself. So just like grape wines, you know, you have a ton that goes on in the vineyard, you know, seasonality, the season that year. Um, sometimes there's frost issues, you know, days of sunlight, water, there's a ton of variables. And a lot of those variables also coincide to the honey that we use and we get honey from all over. So like wherever there's orange grows, you know, even from Florida to Southern California, that's two opposite ends of the U S they're going to have different climates. So pretty interesting. Yeah. That is really interesting. That is, that is really wild. It just, it's just like anything else, the, the soil, the weather. In this case, the insects that it's pollinating all have this play and effect on that honey that you turn in and capture as much of that flavor as possible. Yeah. So let's get into the fun part. Let's open this up. Sounds good. Uh, so which one would you suggest I start with? This, the dry or the sweet? Here? Let's start with the dry wildflower sweet. here. Dry? All right. All right. So I am never, this is the first time I've ever done a digital wine tasting, so to speak, over, over the over, over recording. So I'm going to open it up now. So there may be some awkward... <laughs> silences here while I figure it all out. Yeah, yeah this will be interesting. So you'll, you'll hear, pick up the mic and be roll, running the bottle across the table. So, oh, there you go. Yeah, so this just works out. And see how good I am at, at the uh, at being a pretend small yay here. <laughs> yeah. So I'm going to get critiqued as I do it right. He's watching me do this. Oh, no. All right. Great. <laughs> all right. Come on. There we go. Salute. All right, let's... Give her a quick pour. So this is the wildflower honey wine, 100% wildflower and honey meat. It's a drier palette to it. All right, got a nice pour. Ooh, that's pretty. That is really pretty. So really nice. Well, I mean, honey colored. What would you call that? Yeah. So the color is interesting so, too, because that also goes back to the harvest of the honey. So each batch of wild, uh, okay, go you know super dark amber, extra dark amber, all the way to you know water white. And it's the wild water. Oh yeah. Yes. Yeah, so it's a wildflower honey. So the color changes from batch to batch as well. Oh yeah. That's, that's a, you still get nice. Oral notes on this one. So it's kind of interesting. It's a dry yeah. wine. You still notice a lot of the honey notes in there. Mm-hmm. You know, some honey melon notes as well. The way I describe this is like kind of a very citrus forward. You get some like nutty notes in there as well. Like almond, perhaps definitely maintain a lot of floral honey notes as well. Yeah, I, right on the nose. As soon as I poured it, it just popped it open. The, the floral notes are definitely right there. And that's, it was, it was, the initial palette was a lot lighter than I expected. I, I expected almost that, that, that quick hit of honey when you first like put some honey in your mouth. So, but that was much, much lighter than that, much, yeah, much smoother. Exactly. And that's funny too, because half, about half of our meads are true dry wine, but we start out with honey and it's a big misconception like, oh, it's a honey wine. It must be sweet, but it's like, no, yeah, completely, completely sweet, completely dry. <laughs> that's great. Now I poured myself too much. So I got to finish before going to the next wine. <laughs> yeah. Be on special, good evening. On the nose, you get some of that, you know, light oak notes, but it also lingers through the finish. Mm-hmm. Well, I get more of the oak in the nose than the palate, but yeah, it's really nice. That's really clean. Wow. Yeah. And that's something we strive for as well. We do very good filtrations. We pride ourselves on. And we also, I'm sure you noticed while you're opening it, we use a cork because we do want our mm-hmm. meads or honey wines to be able to be bottle aged. So if you want to sit, uh, I'll save it for a special occasion. You can do that and, mm-hmm. you know, micro oxidation over time, it's going to change as well, but we also do want it to be good right away. So if you want to drink a shot, but go for it. Yeah, it definitely. Yes. This is, this is definitely unique. It's like everything that you expect from a wine, but you're, you don't get that fruit. You get the earthier tones right off the bat and. Usually you have to search for those in some wines. The only, the only, the only earthy, really super earthy tones are super dry, like rosés I get by <laughs> compared to anything. But this is much better than super earthy tones. Oh, yeah. And a lot of the flavor notes, too, are actually from the strain of yeast. So there's two, uh, well, three main flavor components in our meads. 
or oak, whether or not we use oak in that batch. There's yeah. honey itself, of course, and there's the alcoholic yeast for the fermentation. So during the mm -hmm. fermentation, that yeast is going to produce a lot of characters as well. In the industry, you can hear about yeast forward wines. Rosés are very yeast forward wines, or they can be at least, depending on the producer. So the yeast itself, it's sure. often overlooked and, you know, consumers, but it is a large flavor component. So what do you, what do you look for in the, as far as the, the flavor component the yeast gives to the, to the wine? So for the wildflower dry that we're trying now, that one we've actually played around with. And because it's a dry mead, we still wanted to maintain some of those floral honey notes while not masking it. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Hard to maintain it when you ferment it a complete dryness. Whereas the orange blossom note, we really wanted to or the orange blossom mead, we want to maintain a lot of those white flower characteristics. So when we work with our yeast manufacturers, we tell them, you know, hey, we don't even tell them what we're fermenting typically. We just say like, hey, we're fermenting a high bricks wine. We really want to maintain like a lot of high or white floral notes, for example, or we'll tell them like, mm -hmm. or we want some like dark berry fruity notes, almost like a blueberry, for example. And sometimes they'll even break it down to those chemical compounds that are create those notes. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, the more I drink and the more I kick, because of the palate, I'm starting to, I'm even more of the wildflowers kicking up. I'm just like getting like chamomile a little bit, the, the, the fresh flower chamomile a little bit, not that dry. And most of our meads do maintain a lot of floral notes. And part of that is because most of our fermentations are cool fermentations. So we ferment as low as 50 degrees sometimes. Oh, wow. So it's real slow. Okay. You really slow down the fermentation. Real slow, 50 to 60 degrees. And then if we do a malolactic fermentation, sometimes we'll start it off a little hotter than that. So each mm -hmm. of them, it, it's interesting because we do log everything on charts. So it's interesting to watch the temperature stages throughout that fermentation to make sure each yeast That's thrives. Right. Do you ever go like slightly anaerobic when it gets to a certain point or? Yeah. Do you ever let it go that far? Okay. All right. Okay. Well, um, this is the first time I just open the second one here. <laughs> this is cool. Uh, so yeah, I really, really, really appreciate doing this. This is, this is great. This adding another, another level to just really. I guess, you know, the listeners are going to have to like, I hope I'm making them curious enough and we're, we're making curious enough so they can like, Hey, w wait a minute. I want to try some of this too. Yeah. <laughs> and I think it's important to say it too. I mean, meads or honey wines, or it's a small niche category in the beverage world, mm -hmm. but you can take, you know, us as just one brand. We do just traditional meads. So our goal is to highlight specific honey varietals. Design them like mm -hmm. a wine. You can drink them by the glass, pair them with a the meal. And there's other meat producers out there that they may have, you know, more fruit emphasis and they do a ton of fruit meats, you know, they'll add fruit in with their fermentation okay. with their honeys. Mm. It's a small beverage category, but they're no two meats are alike. They're all completely different. Uh, yeah, I, I have to, I'm, I'm trying to think real hard, but this may be like one of the first meats I've had. So this is kind of, this is why this is really wild. How, how fresh and clean clear it is. And so. We're moving on to the orange blossom mead right now. So this is a semi-sweet, you said? Yeah, so this is a semi-sweet. And with okay. any of our meads, at least, if there's any sweetness, it's only mm -hmm. unfermented honey. We don't back sweeten. We don't add any sugars during that fermentation. It's just unfermented honey. So you're tasting that orange blossom honey for itself in that sweetness. Wow. that's And this one, you can see, you know, the color difference. All the meads are going to be, you know, a variation of yeah. gold or amber. This one's a lot lighter in color. It is. Yeah, the other one was darker, right? The nose is, wow, it's still floral, which way you swing it. Yeah. Very floral on this one. Hmm. Wow. Yeah, that's what I was expecting. Ah, there it is. It's like the honey comes about the third flavor in here. So it comes just a little bit later. Like, there it is. It's, it's sweet, but then the honey comes out later. But then you get that nose on it, which you don't ex I, I think if you wouldn't tell me it was sim, if you didn't tell me it was semi-sweet i would have taken it for another dry for a second yeah that sweetness it's balanced since we don't back sweeten you know it's much yeah. more, if we were to back sweeten it'd be super high in whatever sugar we would use like if we're back some honey you get a lot more glucose up there but since it's unfermented honey much more balance between the types of sugars that are remaining yeah, yeah a lot of am i right saying this one oh, okay yeah. am i right in saying this one has a little bit more body yeah, definitely. So this one, some of that body does come from the residual sweetness, but also we do mount mm -hmm. lactic fermentation on this one. So you get some cream notes in there and it's like a creamy texture mm -hmm. feel almost. And that's from the mellow lactic. Okay. You're right. Uh, okay. I mean, that's what, so that's where the yeast kicks in for the, that, that creamy, that, that palate. 
Okay. Yeah. And that, that goes back to well, fermentation cycle. We have, you know, different temperatures during different times mm -hmm. to either favor the al alcoholic fermentation or the malolactic fermentation because they have their own preferred temperature during that fermentation. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about the malolactic fermentation, how that works? So malolactic fermentation, it's not creating alcohol actually. So it's kind of creating body and mouth feel. It does, some of them can create some flavor notes as well. Most of the ones we use though, one actually does produce a lot of vanilla actually. So that's interesting. So yeah. Wow. It's consuming some of the sugars, but it's consuming other things as well. And in the world of honey, like I mentioned earlier, there's, you know, bees are kind of dust magnets. So they collect like, like so many things and pollen and whatnot. And there's still a lot of research being done as well as, as well, like, you know, what happens during the fermentation of honey. So mm -hmm. yeah, that's, that's, that's wild. Okay. Huh? So, uh, th these are, these are great. I really appreciate this. Um, this is, this is really fun. So, um, and this is, you said the wildflower honey was the last batch, uh, produced in Missouri. Yeah. Our dry wildflower, there was our last bottling in Missouri. Okay. That's cool. And so again, I know we're going to talk about where, uh, where to find this and, uh, but yeah, th thanks for sharing these wines. This is, this is really great. I really appreciate you taking the time to send it all the way here to Missouri, St. Yeah. Louis. So, and yeah, so we'll go ahead and we'll continue on and. I just, I hope we're, if you guys enjoyed, listen to us to kind of talk about the wine, taste it, even though you really can't see it, let me know. And uh, this is the first time I got to do this. This is really exciting. I really appreciate this opportunity. And yeah, again, th thanks a lot. So and yeah, we'll continue on. All right. Yeah. Anytime I haven't, you know, anytime I want to talk about mead, it's, I just always think in the back of my mind, like, man, I wish you could just try some right now. So I was really yeah. glad you have a lot of meads so we can discuss them while you taste them. Cause I mean, it's not very, yeah. you know, so like you said, you don't think that you've even had a weed before. So I'm glad you got the opportunity to try it. Yeah. I really, I really appreciate it. This was, this was a really good experience. I really enjoyed that. Thanks very much. Yeah. Thank you. Well, we kind of, kind of got touched on it, but I just want to, since you've made this migration from Herman, Missouri to where is it in Colorado are you now? Um, so our production is located in Hayden, Colorado. It's down Valley of Hayden. Steamboat Springs. It's a ski town basically. Okay. Yeah. Oh, nice. All right. Where do you want to take the business next now that you have moved? Yeah. So my primary goal is scaling the business. You know, I would like to grow it outside of small business territory and have a group of full-time employees that can grow from there. You know, the, the employees would come and grow themselves as individuals. I don't want us to just stay a small business. Mm -hmm. So we have plans to you know, over the next couple of years, hire five full-time employees and grow our export, not only to Missouri, but also distribution statewide to Colorado. And I, so you have not started distributing to Colorado quite yet. No. So Martin brothers winery brand, that's, you know, it's a Missouri grown brand. So we really want to maintain mm -hmm. Missouri and keep that there. And we still have a lot of family in Missouri as well. Now that you're here, are you in a look for to grow your kind of your community presence in Colorado as well. Yes, definitely. So, and in part of that, we did open a separate retail space. So we do have what we call a wine bar um, and it's a wine bar that primarily serves products that we produce, but it's also kind of a community gathering space because in the town of Hayden, there was not a wine bar yet. So we're the wine bar. So it's important to be part of that community nice. as well. <laughs> and then, Aye, yeah. Yeah. I know it. and then for the wine bar specifically, we did start producing grape wines this year out of palisade a yeah. uh, grand valley avium um, so we literally go down there finish those wines on another winery's premise and we bring it up just for re retail in our wine bar space and over time that product line may grow we're uncertain at the moment we just wanted to add some variety for the wine bar in their community all right so you are scaling both in location wine types capacity and variety yeah all right great strategy <laughs> Scaling all around, so to see what works and what doesn't. And the grape wines have been doing great. So, all right. So, where do you see? Actually, now let me ask another question. Oh, for somebody starting something that you're getting into, like you came from engineering, I've come to what I do from molecular plant biology. What do you have advice for any kind of entrepreneur or business owner looking to get into this? Into like wine production or meat production? Why? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I would. First and foremost, start with the process. I mean, you always hear of home brewers coming out of home brewing into the professional scheme or scene. And definitely to me, it's largely process oriented because 
you need to be able to replace yourself. You can't be the one doing everything. So you need to create your recipe, create your process such that you can hire someone and then have them do that as well. No matter what scale you're at, even if it's a part-time employee that comes in and occasionally helps, it buys you so much more time than you would realize. It's, you know, it's awesome. Okay, great. And is, what about, would you have any, I think, did you mention getting kind of working for another winery or meadery or are you just saying if you're jumping in right from home brewing? Oh, I mean, that's a good point. So, so yeah, whether you start your own um, straight from home brewing or you go into work for another winery or meadery, it's kind of going to be the same thing. They're going to have their procedures, their protocol, their standard operating procedures um, that you're going to follow or you might be creating, whether it's your own company or you're the head winemaker for another company. You're going to be creating these things for other people to follow. So it's important to think outside yourself, like, oh, I'm good at making beer or wine or mead and realize to jump into this on a professional entity, it's not just, you know, wine making anymore or mead making. It's also the business aspect of things and you're going to need to develop a team. Okay. And then uh, what do you see the, any kind of trends in your, in this industry, especially with kind of wine and, and, and you're uniquely placed because I can kind of ask you both from the grape standpoint to the mead standpoint. What, where do you see this industry right now? So it's really interesting. Missouri, they have a huge wine industry, but I feel like a lot of it's consumed within Missouri. And paralleling that to Colorado, Colorado's wine industry is a lot smaller. It's only really in one region, whereas Missouri, it's over several. But the Colorado wine market's definitely growing. Um, and mead is as well. But mead's always kind of been a niche industry, and it's pretty broad as well. So what we do with mead, it's, even more niche than just meat. It's just all traditional meads. And to my knowledge, there's only one other meadery that does that. It's Hydron Meadery out of California. They do all traditional mm -hmm. meads, but they're all champagne style. So yeah. they'll also be highlighting honey varietals like us, but it's a champagne style beverage. So it's interesting because it's still a niche industry, but it is growing pretty rapidly. I mean, I think St. Louis has three or four meaderies in the region now. So yeah, there's, there's a, there's one pretty much in my backyard. I'm, yeah. I'm going to get him on the show today so, sometime soon as well. Uh, yep. <laughs> yeah. Let's see. So what is like, we've talked a lot about just growing, scaling and what you'd recommend to other people wanting to start something like this. What is like the most important thing you've learned from, well, since like 2016, which you jumped in with both feet? It definitely your career. becomes real. So wanting to jump into something that most people would see as a hobby or a passion project, once it becomes a business, it becomes real. You know, when you look at your cost mm -hmm. of goods sold for starting a fermentation, for example, especially meat, because you're buying your raw honey ingredient, it, it's a lot of cost right up front. Whereas if you have a vineyard or something, you're growing it, that cost is spread out over time. So, you know, jumping into it, it's, you learn a lot of cash flow management business and things that you normally wouldn't learn. And my background is mechanical engineering. So I definitely had to dive head first into learning some aspects of business as well. Yeah. Yeah. I feel you there. Yeah. I, I was a rec I was a recluse with a pipette and now I'm learning how to build a business. Exactly. So. <laughs> so, yeah, a recluse, yeah. like you said too. So same here, you know, engineering background, we're all kind of known as recluse. Yeah. So when you're producing mm -hmm. a product that needs human interaction, you know, you got to put yourself out there and get uncomfortable and do some tastings, talk to people. Yes, totally feel you there. Well, yeah. <laughs> I agree. So, and then you said you're looking to scale a team. When, when, when does, when does that fall into place? Um, kind of as it progresses. I mean, as being the only owner here, I don't really want to mm -hmm. work with investors. I've, we've always grown it through cash flow, fortunately, and always played our cards right. Um, COVID definitely hit us hard and we're still paying for that as our many. And one thing I didn't mention, you know, why Colorado, you know, during COVID, after COVID, it was kind of, the business was at a point, you know, we were less than 2000 cases annually. And it was like, well, do we let it die or do we kind of rekindle this and reignite it? So I decided to rekindle it, reignite it. And that's how it ended up moving to Colorado rather than just like a small expansion project or something. Cause mm -hmm. The idea initially was like, oh, we can expand some production to Colorado. You know, it's a niche product. We could just have small production here, small production there and kind of feed those markets. But it ended up working out to just completely close the Missouri location and just move everything here entirely. So 
Right now, I do have a small team running the wine bar aspect entirely. So once I get production up and going, get a couple batches out there, I'll be hiring a production team for that. Mm -hmm. Okay. And that just reminds me of something I worked on with with a, fr a friend client of mine that we were trying to identify teams for them because the, the, the biggest piece is unloading all the hats you get to wear right now. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And, um, and the biggest thing that surprised me is we, what we ended up doing was redefining the owner's position. And then what everything was offloaded, we prioritized all those pieces and they became positions and you were able to, and you actually knew what they were because you were already doing them and you could prioritize pieces. And it was really easy for that person to write out the, the job descriptions afterwards because it was all laid out based on what that you want that person to do, discuss, and decide. Yep. And once we did that, it was really, it was really nice. And also for yourself, what do you want to do, discuss, and decide, and and break that down? And we actually rewrote the their position. Like they were they were interviewing for their own position again. Oh wow! <laughs> and Funny. yeah, so you're like, oh, do I really want to do this? Yeah. After they actually had it all taken out, so it was a neat way to do it. It was a neat way to do it real fast and and have everything kind of laid out for you. So when you had it. When you had it there, you're ready to you know jump on it, and it wasn't like okay, now I need to hire somebody. Yeah, exactly. what do I need to say? So I mean, so, it's very. It just reminded me of that. It was like you said, many hats, and you know, starting out, you're a new brand in, in a, a large, very large market. Mm -hmm. So when you want to maintain your spot on a you know a liquor store shelf, for example, you need to go there, you need to do tastings, yeah. promotions, and then over time, you know how to explain that product. So once you hire an employee, you could show them to the T exactly how to do it. And that's why I mentioned earlier, yeah. you know, being able to scale and have those processes and procedures written down because that buys you so much time by like, okay, I feel confident in this employee to do this. I don't have to be there anymore for that. And on the production Absolutely. side as well, you know, you can spend all day just cleaning tanks, but having that standardized, yeah. you know, and you've done it a million yeah. times, you know, where to start. Yeah. You know, your concentrations of cleaners and, you know, everything. So to be able to create that into a process control procedure or a standard operating procedure, for example, and have someone else yeah. that requires you days at that point. And then, oh, absolutely. And yeah. Yeah. And as a business owner, you, yep, can, absolutely. you can refocus elsewhere. Yeah. That's definitely where my passion lies. You, you started nailing off. Like, I got to tell you about this. <laughs> so that was, <laughs> all right. So a big question. It's the hardest question for some. It's the easiest question for others. What is your favorite beverage? Oh man. I'm so you can answer two different ways. You can answer, <laughs> what is your favorite beverage of the ones that you produce? And what is your favorite beverage outside of the, what you produce? Okay. So favorite, I could answer both of those, I guess. But my favorite beverage of what we produce is our dry wildflower mead. Reason is, I don't know, maybe it's a little hipster of me per se, but it's kind of against the grain in all aspects. It's a traditional 100% wildflower honey mead. But it's fermented a complete dryness and stainless and it's somewhat of a crowd pleaser in some way because it's something you can bring to Thanksgiving dinner and you don't have to tell people it's a honey wine. They'll just drink it and they'll be like, oh, this is a great dry white wine. It's somewhat of a crowd pleaser in that way, but it's also one that has some slight oak emphasis, which I am, I'm a fan of oak. So back to my uh, the other question is our my favorite beverage would probably be bourbon. I'm a huge bourbon, fan of oak. Right. And we currently actually have staves aging in Missouri right now for two years that Fooder Crafters is going to turn into some Fooders and we'll start a barrel series where they're fermented in those Fooders. That's cool. Yeah. That'll be interesting. Wow. I mean, wow. So that big All right. Oak. So, bur <laughs> yeah. so bourbon and a dry honey wine, a fl floral. Yep. All right. All right. That's great. Great. Yeah. So <laughs> do you have any upcoming like events or promotions or anything you got going on? So here we kind of do a lot of things. So like we're west of the Rockies. So this Wednesday we have an avalanche safety awareness kind of thing. So a lot of, a lot of things for the local community here, for sure. Like those are held at our wine bond. Definitely keep your eyes peeled for tastings as our distribution grows in Missouri. Um, but also we are going to create an online code for your listeners. It's going to be called harvest to pour. So it'll be 15% off of products. And if you buy six we'll right. or it's free shipping anyways, so. Oh, I really appreciate that. Yeah, definitely put that out there for the listeners. It'll be in the show notes. You can catch that, catch that code and go to, where is it? Martinbrothers.com? Yep. Martinbrotherswinery.com. 
and then uh, put pick your favorite honey wine and put that code in for 15% off. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah. And on our website, too, right. you can be able to learn about each product and about the process as well. All right. Is there anything else that's going on you want to talk about or? Yeah. It's kind of a growing region here for beverage. You know, coming from Herman, there's what, five distilleries now, one brewery and a dozen wineries. So when I first came here, there was only two breweries and a distillery. So now there's three breweries and three distilleries and another winery. So it's kind of a growing beverage region here as well. And it's called the Yampa Valley. It's located along the uh, Yampa Valley River here. So it's interesting to see how those businesses grow as well and working to collaborate with them. The local economic development groups here, they've created a food and beverage manufacturing group. So definitely helping kindle those relationships and see where awesome. collaboration can grow from there. All right. So you, you see, you see a lot of new people coming in or is it people like you with, a, you know, with a couple of years experience or more than that coming in to, to grow this, this area? A combination of both actually, um, down Valley okay. and Craig, it's the next County over. I know someone starting a distillery there is a retirement project. There is a distillery mm. that's primarily gin distillery in town here that was starting through COVID. So that was kind of a rough start. <laughs> wow. Yeah. 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 And then there's a distillery that moved up here from Denver. They have some years of experience. So it's a combination of both. And then you have a local brewery that has location in all three towns along the river here. Mm. Okay. So yeah. Well, I'm awesome. talking about some people moving here, some people starting here. Well, definitely listeners, you you see the, uh, you you find yourself in, in what, what part of Colorado was that again? The Hayden, Colorado is where our production is, but Hayden. yeah, it's all on Valley of Steamboat Springs. It's a ski resort town right. along the Yampa Valley river. It's one of the few free flowing rivers in the U S so it's a pretty interesting place to live. find yourself out there skiing, hit them up for some honey wine. <laughs> yeah. 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 I definitely would. So Derek, this has been great. We could keep going and going, but I really want to, you know, conscious of your time. And thanks a lot for being on the show, talking to us. This is really cool. This is my first, you're my first meadery that's also a winery and uh, that has moved from, from Missouri to Colorado. It's been real interesting to talk, talk to you about your challenges, how you're wanting to scale. Hope anybody listening is inspired by this and can take any notes to throw into their beverage industry company or get one started. Again, Derek, uh, I really like, thanks again for your time. I really appreciated it. Yeah, thank you as well. And definitely stay in touch. <laughs> All right. All right. Well, thanks again. And I really appreciate your time. Yeah, thank you as well. Thank you for listening to Harvest to Pour, the business of beverages with Matthew Shep. Check the show notes for our guest contact information and connect with Matthew Shep on LinkedIn today. <laughs>